today, gals, I, I don't know. I say this every time. Someone's probably going to get offended, okay? But sit, just stay. Just stay for the whole thing. It, it's good. Um, we're going to talk about what I think is this, is, this character that we're going to look at in the Bible is, is the feminist's favorite Bible story. So you already know where I'm going. You know where I'm going. So let's turn in our Bibles to Judges 4, because I want us to look at what the Bible says about this particular woman, woman, because we have all kinds of pictures that have been given to us about this. So Judges in your Bible, towards the beginning of your Bible, kind of, it, it gets lost in there somehow. But let's look at Judges 4. So I'm going to read the first couple verses of it, and then I want to give you some background of where we're at here in the story of Scripture, uh, just to give us some context. But it starts in Judges 4, verse 1, and it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly, for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, a wife of Lipidoth, was, ju was judging Israel at the time. And she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, so let's pause there. So, yep, there we go. We're going to talk about, about Deborah. Lots to say about Deborah. So the context of our story here in Scripture, we're like only 200 years after the people had been freed from slavery in Egypt. And I don't know if 200 years sounds like a long time to you or a short time. At first when I was thinking of this, I was like, that's not even that long. And did you see that first line? It says, again, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But 200 years, it's kind of the United States foundation, right? We look back at when our country was formed and, you, you know, rightly in a lot of ways on a very godly foundation and you can look around and go and again the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord so I maybe we can resonate a little bit more with where the people are at where Deborah is at in this story of maybe those days of when we were walking with the Lord seemed a little bit maybe they do seem really far away and maybe it feels just like it does to us to her that everything's dark, everything's bad, and the world seems a little bit turned upside down. Now, you'll notice these are the judges. They didn't have kings yet, but rather, rather they had these judges that were settling disputes that the people would have. Now, I, I made reference to that line that said, again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So I just want to give us some context about what evil. You can, you can flip back in your Bible just a couple pages and look at Judges 2. And Judges 2, 11 through 12 says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then it kind of says what, what that was, what they did. They served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods, uh, and went from among the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. So this describes when they're saying they did evil in the sight of the Lord, what is that evil? And it's, again, we kind of go, well, we're not worshiping to any Baal. We're not really that bad. We can't really relate to these people. But, you know, even that line that it says uh, that they accepted the gods from the people around them. We kind of do that. Uh, you know, we've talked about in, uh, I think it was the introduction to Find by Design, how we've kind of allowed culture to very much influence the church. We allow culture and the world to influence even how we read our Bibles sometimes. I'm going to go so far as to say we definitely let culture and the world define how we read the story of Deborah sometimes. So, yeah, we kind of worship the gods among us too sometimes. We kind of look and see, well, what are they doing? How, how is that? We get curious, and then that curiosity then turns to, oh, oh, maybe there's something to that. And then we move away from the Lord. We turn from the Lord. We abandon the Lord, even as they did. So in some ways, I see a lot of similarities between them and us. Now, what should they have done? You, again, you can flip a couple other pages, or you can go back, because we're really towards the end, whether it wasn't Joshua, that they were given the charge of what they were supposed to be doing. And this is the command for them, this is the command for us. And it says in Joshua 24, 14, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve 
whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I love that charge. Joshua has it. In, there, it's there in the ends of Joshua a couple times. It's also when you get the beginning of Judges and it repeats it again. Choose. Serve the Lord. And we have that similar condition in our culture. And we also have the similar choice today. Just like they were told, obey. Obey the Lord. Fear the Lord. In, in, in the most reverent and, and actual meaning of that word, fear the Lord rightly. Serve the Lord. But you're going to have to pick. There's no neutral. This is, this is a problem we have in our culture, in, as, I, as I think they did too. People who just don't want to choose. Just let me just straddle the fence. And, you know, I'll hear what you say, I'll hear what they say, and I'm just going to stay right here down the middle. That's a dangerous place to be. You will go one way or the other. You cannot, you know, you can't just stay there. You got to choose. So same position that was given to them. So back to our story here. Who's Deborah? That's the context. That's what we're looking at. Who was Deborah? So we first see her name, Deborah. What do you think the name Deborah means? And I know many of you are going to go, warrior princess. That's what it is, right? It's Deborah, warrior princess. No, it's honeybee. It's this kind of sweet, like honeybee name. That's all it is, right? And it, I, I add that because a lot of times we have these pictures in our mind about Deborah, even as we read this story. And I think we need to come back to the meaning of her name. It's this little tiny honeybee. I don't even think honeybees bite, do they? They don't sting. They just, you know, they're just honeybees. So it, it's, it's just, the, it's such a juxtaposition to what maybe we have. I want to just look biblically at Deborah and take away some of the worldly things that we have kind of maybe put upon this really cool model of biblical womanhood in scripture. Honeybee. But then it says also what she is. She, it says that Deborah, we read it in verse four, it said that now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, which that's all we hear about him, we don't know anything about her husband, was judging Israel at that time. So it tells us three things about who she is. She's a prophetess, she's a wife, and she's judging Israel at that time. So as we're doing our study with biblical womanhood, I do want to look at different roles and different things that women, um, that roles that they have throughout scripture. And one of them here that we see with Deborah here is the prophetess. So let's look at this, what that means to be a prophetess, because it kind of has a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a mystique, a little bit of a, maybe even something like, okay, that sounds kind of weird to be a prophetess. But it's just, it, it, this cal, it's a, a gal who speaks or proclaims the message of a deity. Now, you notice the definition says of a deity because there were a lot of false prophets and prophetesses and and people that were not actually speaking for the one true God. So the idea here behind Deborah is that she is a prophetess speaking for God. She's proclaiming the message that God has given her. And in, in Old Testament, you see prophets. We have lots of the prophets, Moses on down. Some of them received messages directly from God and they passed those on through writing or speech. Some of them were like Joseph and Daniel that interpreted dreams and visions. But the messages of the, of the prophecies of the sometimes for the future, but they were also messages for the listener and often they included warnings is what the prophets had. So there's a couple of the prophetesses that we see in scripture, and I do mean a couple, okay? There's just not a lot, but I want to show you a couple here. So we have an Exodus 15, 20, where it tells us about Miriam. So Miriam, Aaron, and Moses' sister, she's called a prophetess. It says, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. This is a, right before leading, in the, uh, leading the Israelites even in worship here. And we see Miriam in that role, and she is called a prophetess. A couple other prophetesses, that's a really hard, that's a lot of S's to say, okay? 2 Kings 22 talks about a um, prophetess named Huldah. Not a lot of mention about her, but she seems like she was a, a prophetess used by the Lord during the reign of King Josiah. And so there's a brief message of her there. Isaiah's wife. It's literally the shortest mention of a, of a prophetess, but in Isaiah 8, 3, it says the prophetess's wife, or my wife, the prophetess. Okay, so there you go. Um, not a lot. There, like I said, there were some examples of some false prophets. There's this gal called Noadiah, not a good example. She was probably a false prophet. So there's not a ton. There's, there's not a lot of uh, these gals that served in this role throughout the Old Testament that, is, that scripture tells us about. 
Now, don't get this confused with the New Testament when it talks about prophesying. Now, in the New Testament, there is the listing of one prophetess, and we talked about her on Tuesday night. Remember, Anna um, is said that she was a prophetess. But the, when, the, when the New Testament is talking about prophecy, because it, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about every wife who prays and prophesies. That's not the role of prophetess. That's different. Prophecy in the New Testament is, is a word of edification that the Lord gives to an individual for, for that person to share. Okay, So that's different. Sounds similar. It's a different type of, type of word there, though. Um, so my point in pointing these few instances out to you is because I do think it's important as we study Scripture, as it pertains to biblical womanhood, to be careful to not shout where Scripture whispers. Uh, I've heard Pastor Brett say that many times. I don't know if he's originally said it. I'm giving him credit because that's who I learned it from. But don't shout where Scripture whispers. And what I mean by that is sometimes in the instances even that something is brought up, right? You know, we just have these couple instances where these women played this role. I'm not going to add to that. I'm not going to subtract to that. I'm just going to point out the fact that sometimes people make a giant deal about see. There was a prophet, a see, there was a judge, there was this. And it's like one or two or three. Meanwhile, you have scripture filled with all other examples that aren't women. So I'm not trying to draw any conclusion to that other than to highlight, like, let's be careful to like read things biblically and not make a bigger case out of something that the Bible doesn't seem to make a bigger case out of either. So that's important because the, that leap, this Deborah, particularly as we study this story, that she is often used as this example of like, see, see, this is what women are supposed to be doing because Deborah. I wonder if Deborah would have said that. Because again, one, we're, we're, we'll keep going on that. I want to I show you some other things, but let's keep reading Judges 4 here and let's get more into the story here. So go back to Judges 4 and let's pick up in verse 6 where we left off. Okay, so she, she, just, uh, she describes, it describes Deborah, who she was. And then it says in verse six, she, sum, she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, and, and from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river of Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Okay, there's kind of an interesting thing that happens here is that you, Deborah kind of lays out this plan, okay? She lays out sort of a plan here, but do you notice she, she's not saying, she's giving this word to Barak. She says, hey, God said to do something here. So who is Barak? Who, who is he even in the story? His name doesn't mean honeybee. His name actually means lightning, okay? Getting into a little more heroic terminology here, right? His name means lightning, and he was the leader of the military. Now, it's interesting to me that with Deborah, most of the judges, and, I, and we're going to kind of look through these a little bit, because most of the judges are military leaders themselves. Like, that's kind of the thing they did. They, they saved the people. It says that over and over, and it says they, a, a judge was raised up, and they saved the people. But Deborah, she's a judge, but unlike all the other judges, or most of them anyway, she's not a military leader at all. She's not like, you know, say Gideon, who was raised up and, and fights all these battles. She's not that. It just says that she's the judge. So that's an interesting distinction. Again, just reading what's here, not adding to it. If you look uh, back at Judges 2.16, I just want to show you this, what it says about the judges, because I think this is interesting. But in Judges 2.16, it, it gives this kind of blanket statement about this time of the judges that, is, that we're going to read about for the rest of the book. And it says in 16, it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Okay, so right there it says that the Lord raised these judges up. So then as you go through, there's 12 judges. As you read some of them, there's this guy, Othiniel. It says in 3.9. And it says specifically there, the Lord raised up a deliverer, it says in there. If you go to 3.15, it, it talks about this guy, Ehud. Pastor Brett just talked about him a couple weeks ago. And it says the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Then you flip the page, you've got these two guys, well, you have Shamgar, okay, that it does not say that. It doesn't say that the Lord raised him up. It just says that Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goat and also saved Israel. That's like the only mention of him. It doesn't say the Lord raised him up. It just says, here's Shamgar. Then you have 
Gideon. The Lord appeared to him directly. So I'm going to say the Lord raised him up. You have two other guys, Tola and Jair, in 10, 1, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. And it just says, there arose to save Israel. Again, the absence of the Lord raised up. And then you have Samson, who Samson, the Lord appeared to his parents. So I think we could see how the Lord raised him up too. My point is, is that sometimes scripture explicitly, clearly says the Lord raised up and sometimes it's not there. I don't, I'm not necessarily making a conclusion about that, but I'm trying to make a point that with, with Deborah, it's not there. It does not say that the Lord raised Deborah up. Now in 2.16, I'm, I'm giving you, it does say the Lord raised up judges, but I think it's important to note there's some of these judges that that language is not there again. And I don't know, I don't know why that is, but I don't think we necessarily want to insert either and draw this picture of, again, inserting language. Remember what Eve did? She added a little bit to it. It's not said right here that the Lord raised Deborah. It says the Lord raised up judges, but it doesn't say the Lord raised up Deborah. I don't know if I'm making more of that than there is. I'll let you guys make that conclusion and read the scriptures for what it says. But I want to be careful to read what it says and what it doesn't say. And, and I want to note that. So why is Deborah a judge at all? You know, it says she's the wife of Lebedoff judging Israel at that time. Why is she not like all the other judges, a man? This is the question that's asked. And this is where sometimes we do add in, erroneously or not, we add in our cultural like, well, clearly it's because, I don't even have to say it. You guys already know where I'm going with that because that's where what culture says. But why is she not like the men? Why, why, did not the, why is there not a man that was raised up here? Now, I think there is some significance here. And a nation at this time is, would have been considered incredibly weak and upside down if it was ruled by a woman. Okay, before you get offended, hang on, hang on. I'm not making it up. Go read Isaiah 3.12 here, okay? Isaiah says, my people, infants are the, their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides mislead you and you have swallowed up the course of your paths. It's not a compliment to a nation to go, you're being led by women, okay? Again, I can say that and already people are like, I, it's so indignant. You know, what do you mean we're weak if women are, I'm just saying, read it. It just it says, it's not, it's not necessarily a compliment. And it could have been a little bit of an indictment really on Israel at this time that they're in such a state that this is what Isaiah would say of them, that you're being ruled by women. Now, there is some implications because then it's like, well, why, where were the men? What were the men doing here? So we're going to get to that. But the, the point is, is that men were supposed to lead. Like, we know that in this story. We're, we're going to see it over and over. Now, I'm not going to say that women, that God did not put women in unique positions of influence all throughout Scripture, and including this one, because he did. He does it here. He does it with Esther. Man, we, I loved studying the book of Esther when we did that study, because you could see the unique ways that the Lord clearly put, Deborah, or put Esther in that situation for, as the verse says in 417, for such a time as this. So God uses women in very unique places to be an influence into their culture, in the other people that are around them, and in really big ways. So that should not be understated. But I can't dogmatically say that the examples that were given here with Esther or even with Deborah are meant to be a model for us achieving power. Because over and over and over again, the scriptures point to that the men are supposed to lead. They're supposed to lead. This scripture, this passage that we're reading, this story is giving us a, 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 like an example of when the man was not leading and it's not like good for you. No, it's like, it's not good. There, it's there in scripture that the men were supposed to lead. And again, I just don't want to shout where scripture doesn't seem to on this issue that this is a blanket statement and therefore women should always be achieving for positions of power and leadership over whichever. In this case, this was an indictment on the country. 
So, but don't hear that as like, oh, so you're saying women can't be influential. No, that is definitely not what scripture is saying either because she was very influential. So let's keep reading our story. Let's go back to uh, Judges here and pick up in verse eight and see, because she just gives uh, Barak this word like, okay, this is what the Lord told me. Here's the plan. Go to it, okay? And let's see what Barak says. In verse eight, he says, Barak said to her, if you'll go with me, I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I know I'm reading into that, but, and if you've ever heard Pastor Brett read it, you got to hear Pastor Brett read it because he reads it the best, okay? And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went back with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 went up at his heels, and Deborah went with him. Now, I wanted to read that whole thing because there, there is so much that is just even in a few couple verses, but start at the beginning. This is where everybody goes. They read Derek Barak's response and, and he's like, I'm not going. And, and this is where gals go, see, he wouldn't do it. So if, if he's not going to do it, clearly a woman has to go and do this job. The man wouldn't do it. And I'm, I'm not going to say this is Barak's shining moment because clearly it is not, Okay. But what is it that Deborah says, okay? Because she could have come in and said, hey, I, there's this battle and I'm going to lead this. And honestly, Barak would have been like, cool, that's a great plan. But she didn't do that. Go back and read verse 6 again. It said in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, it said, um, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you go? You go. And it's almost when she even says, has not the Lord, you kind of wonder, did Barak already know? Like, did Barak know, okay, I'm the military leader, I'm supposed to be leading. He kind of knew. And Deborah is there encouraging him to lead. Do it. You do it. So then you read the story and Barak's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it. And she says, okay, I'm going to go. Even at the very end when it says, and Deborah went with him. This is where I think we need to accompany. What does with him mean? With him means exactly what it says, went with him. Our picture, I bet you anything, you picture Deborah kind of riding out on the white horse, sword drawn, you know, leading the charge. That's not what's being said here. She went with him. She accompanied him. She's there. She's not leading the charge. And if you read the rest of the story, and I'll, I'm just going to summarize how this goes, because then you get in all, all the battle stuff, and you're like, Amy, this is a women's study. We don't really care about all the battle scenes. But it's a cool story because, the, you know, I read at the beginning, it pointed out that this enemy had 900 iron chariots. Now, as gals were like, yeah, I don't, don't really care. But that would have been like the most cutting edge. This would have been an enemy to be feared. They, they would have been untouchable in their minds. Like there's nothing we can do about an army that has 900 iron chariots. It would have been the best equipment of the day. And the, the win, the, the, the battle goes, and, and Deborah, she is there continuing to encourage Barak. And it's kind of the victory is given with a combination of the sword and Barak leading the, uh, leading the battle and all of that, but also a supernatural element. You read, if you keep going in Judges 5, where Barak and Deborah have this song on how the battle is won. And there is this element that there was either some kind of unseasonable rainstorm or something that caused the river to rise rise and sweep them away. And this is, there's kind of an interesting geographic element to this because the place where they, were, they came for this battle was kind of just a, a, a plain that in the, in the wet season would have been very marshy. You're probably not going to bring iron chariots to a marshy area. So the Lord brings this rainstorm in that makes this incredibly difficult. The waters sweep up and, they, and ends up being a part of that victory that the Lord really won that day. So it was a combination. Now, Sisera, the leader of that, of that army, he gets away in the middle of that battle. They're victorious over, but the leader gets away and he sneaks off and he ends up finding himself in uh, the tent of jail. That's another story that you probably will not be reading to your daughters as they go to bed tonight, but I'm just saying, maybe we'll hit that one another time. But the point with the story that I want us to look at is, see, a lot of us look at Deborah and like I said, she's, she's kind of billed as like the, she's the, the, the feminist Christian superhero, and we interpret this as, see, this is an example in Scripture of when there isn't a man to do the job, then women, you just have to. You need to step up and you need to do your thing. Now, I think some of that's there. 
I think some of that is partially supported by scripture, but I think that we need to adapt our attitude and our tone to match Deborah's in this because she does step up and, and, and she does do those things that really the Lord equipped her to do in that moment. She does, but check her tone. Deborah's this really unique example to me because I think there's this element of biblical womanhood that is not only good with the leadership of men, but she actually encourages it. She supports it. She, she goes to Barak and says, here's what God said you're supposed to do. Now she says she'll go with, right? She's like, I'll help you, I'll support you. But she doesn't step in and try to take the lead and try to take the char charge. There is throughout scripture, you see these just little examples. And I think Deborah really highlights this. She's good with men leading. You're like, please don't say that line again. That shouldn't be offensive to us, ladies. It really should not. Because again, we don't want to shout where scripture kind of is a little more chill about how many, we don't have any women military leaders in this. We, that's not what she is. So Deborah continues to encourage him. Even if you get to, I'll read to you verse 14 in the battle scene because they're kind of in the middle of it. And Deborah, she says in 14 to Barak, up, this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into my, oh wait, it doesn't say my hand. The Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak then went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. She continues to encourage this. So she continues to just go, I'm good with you leading this charge and I'm going to continue cheering you on. So that's interesting to me. So why is this a big deal if Barak leads? Why, why are you camping out on this? And I, just some uh, general, again, I'm not, this is nothing super intelligent here. But first, because God said to. Like back in verse six, it doesn't say, God did not say, Deborah, go lead this battle. It's just very clear. He said, Deborah, go tell Barak to go do this. So God just says, Barak, you're supposed to lead. And as I was just talking about it a bit ago, male leadership is kind of all over the Bible. So let's look at some of these, because there are some leadership roles in, in the Bible that men and women have, and some of them are the same, and then there's some, very, there's some differences. So some that are the same. We see, we're studying here right now the judge, right? Both men and women, it would seem, are judges. Now, again, we have an example of one judge, but it happens, okay? We also see kings and we see queens. Now, interesting though, our queens, the queens are a funny one to me because there are some good queens. We've got Esther, you know, you might even look at Vashti in that, in that story of a queen. Then you have also some queens, whenever the queen looks as if she's trying to usurp the power of the king um, or of, of the male leader, it's, it's usually just a horrendous picture, you know? You got, you got Jezebel and not, no one, no one is looking at her going, I want to be like Jezebel, you know? So it, it, as you observe scripture, like the, the queens that try to be usurping that authority over the king or over the one that is supposed to be leading, they're not really built in glowing terms. But you see women leading as queens. And I think like in the case of Esther, you see how the Lord used her in that role of influence in a really cool way. So we also see prophets, lots and lots and lots and lots of prophets, right? Read the Old Testament, tons and tons of prophets. We see that over and over and over. We see some prophetesses and I brought those up here. So we've got a few, we've got a few. Don't wanna say those are not there, but there's not a lot. Uh, lead, other leadership roles, dads. Dads are a leadership role. I would also say mothers in their homes, not over their dads, but there is leadership that moms have over their children, over their household that is supported by scripture. So, and th that one is especially just a really cool picture that shows this, this the, you know, it even says in Ephesians 5, submitting one to another, but the father, the husband is meant to be the leader of that home. And that's really, really clear. We're gonna talk about that a lot this next um, week in Defined by Design. But we see this, that it is a leadership role that is primarily fathers, but mothers have leadership in that over their children and their households as well. Then we have a couple of these that are, again, this is where scripture I say shouts, okay? We have elders, men leadership roles in elders. We're gonna talk about that. Those are, these are all things you're all excited because we're gonna hit on this on Tuesday in week three. It's gonna be a blast. But 1 Timothy, Titus, they talk about the men that are the elders. 
priests. There's no women priests in the Old Testament. They, they're, just, they're just not there. And then also we don't see any women military leaders. Those seem to be roles that are in Scripture just, as, just for men as well. So the reason I point this out is just because it just, it, it's just there. It's not, I don't think it's meant to be a giant, huge deal. It's just that there are things that the Bible consistently throughout Scripture has men do, and there are counterparts in some of those that he has women do, but they are different. So why does male leadership seem to be such a clear biblical concept? Now, this is going to echo back to what we have been studying, because 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 9 says, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, we're going to look at this uh, passage a whole bunch this week. Do I look excited? You guys, I'm so excited. Okay, because this is in the context of the head covering passage, and it's actually such a great passage. But it's an, we quote this verse a lot, so that's why I want to make sure we look at the whole context of what that, what that is talking about there. But for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. This is going back to the garden and, and, and what we see in Genesis. That woman was even made of a different substance, and she is made actually physically out of something from the man. She's not made of the dirt that he was made of. She's made out of a different substance, something that is distinct. We also read in Genesis where it says, I will create a helper fit for him. That's something that is, in, is something for him. So, and again, don't, don't read like that's just the helper thing. We're going to talk about that when we get to week four. But these are, these are strong words, but they are necessarily under, there is this authority, there is this biblical model that men were in this leadership role. And it, it's all over scripture. I, I keep telling you guys that not, that's why I said devoted lives. We're just going to kind of tuck these in with the divine by design. Because if I've spent each time, like just trying to unpack each one, I mean, guys, that's why it's going to take a year, okay, um, for us to go through these. Because there is just a lot here. And, and it's all so not complicated. But it takes time to get through it. So sometimes if I say little things that just seem like a little piece of the picture, well, it probably is just a little piece of the picture. That's why we're continuing to study this as we go on. So am I saying then that women can't be used in the public square or be used in any power position? Okay. Am I saying that? I think I've already answered that question, but I'm trying to hit on a couple things because sometimes some of you are just going to hear a certain thing that I say, and you're going to get a little, little defiant on that. But when we say, so are you saying women can't do anything? Do you notice how we often get offended by something? We just, we jump to the extreme of something that wasn't said. Eve did that same thing, right? Remember when, when uh, in the garden and she said that uh, when she and the serpent are having their little chat and she says, I can't even touch it. God didn't actually say that, but she's like, she goes to that extreme. extreme. Not only can I, can I not eat of it, I can't even touch it. We sort of do the same thing. We're like, so you're saying I can't do anything? I'm just supposed to be at home doing nothing and I can't be ever used for any, any other thing outside my home? It's not what we're saying. That's why I keep studying the scripture. But minimally, it is clear that biblical roles of leadership are primarily, not exclusively, but are primarily given to men. So like I said, everyone's first retort was, well, it's the culture. You're just talking about this horrible patriarchal culture that was so oppressive to women. <sighs> okay, there's a lot to that debate on culture. And a lot of times we like to just slap that word on it and go, yeah, it's culture, so I'm not even going to hear anything else you say because it was culture. Culture, culture, culture. How's our culture doing? Okay, never mind. That's another issue. <laughs> the point is, should culture be our bellwether? Should culture be the thing that is going, well, that, this is what the culture says, and so therefore, because as we study these verses, the Lord is going to be really, really clear about these things, and they are not contingent on culture. So, like I said, when we get into the, we're going to talk about that in 1 Corinthians, we're going to talk about that in Ephesians a little bit, because that's where a lot of times people want to turn some of this, what God intended, Adam was created first, then woman, okay? It said right there in 1 Corinthians, man was not made from woman, woman from man. That wants to take this and just, just totally flip this and say, well, it's culture. Does that sound cultural? No, that sounds like the Garden of Eden to me. That's not cultural. That's actually how we were made, what we were made from. It, it's just, it's kind of just a reality moment, gals. 
it, it's just not a cultural context. Now, does that mean culture doesn't matter? Not saying that either. Culture does matter, and you should study things within the culture in which they're there. I get that. But don't allow this culture trump card that everyone wants to use negate what Scripture clearly teaches, right? Don't, we, we need to be, where Scripture's being really clear, we need to be really clear. Culture's a big, hot, muddy mess. But the Scriptures are really clear, so that's, what, that's the point I want to make. So just be careful of that culture trump card because it is really used a ton and they try to use it to supersede a very clear biblical principle, something that you see all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So not cultural, okay? All right. So one of the things I want to correct though is because, like I said, sometimes people will hear this and you're like, okay, so again, not saying this, but they'll say, oh, so I'm just, I can't do anything. I'm, I'm just this, you know, feminine, wimpy thing and I, and I can do nothing. I want us to also biblically correct what the feminine filter should look like. Because people read this verse incorrectly sometimes. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, with the, uh, with you of the grace of life so that your prayers not be hindered. I'm betting there's some of you, and no judgment, I get it, we get stuck there. Nobody heard anything else I said after weaker vessel. <laughs> weaker vessel? I am not weak. That's what we wanted to cry and scream. And, you know, we so miss this point. Do you, I mean, just look at the second part of that verse. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Heirs. We, we are his daughters. We have been, we, he, he wants us. We're his kids. Like you, there's so many scriptures that talk about the inheritance we have with God, our king, our father. We're co-heirs with that. It's not, that's not a less than rule. There's nothing that's, that's saying that you don't get as much of that inheritance as the men do. That doesn't say that. And that is of utmost importance, right? Because that's talking about our salvation. That's talking about where we get to spend eternity we are co-heirs with that. That's huge. We just stop at the weaker vessel thing. Because wait, what? What? That sounded insulting. It's actually not. This just speaks to different function. Okay? Different function. Remember, we've, we keep bringing up the reference. We're made from different stuff, right? Dirt, bone, totally made out of different things. Um, we look different, okay? Men and women look very different. This speaks to different Function. And, you know, Pastor Brett's example that he's given for years, I used to coordinate weddings here at Athey. And um, so I have probably heard more wedding messages that Pastor Brett's done than probably anybody else other than Debbie, his wife, you know, um, because he always gives this beautiful example when he's talking about this of, you know, women are like the fine wine glass and men are like the root beer mug. They both hold stuff, okay? But one is beautiful. One is more delicate. They're not, they're not, you know, it's not like one has a hole in it and one does They're just made differently. That's it. And I don't find that very offensive. I, I think it should just be kind of clear. And, and everybody is all good with, uh, you know, they all want the equality thing and, and say, no, you have to just say that we're exactly the same until you kind of are glad that we're different. So if this, if this building catches fire, okay, and we all get outside, but one of you is left in here. You're, you're stuck under one of these camera things or something. I don't know. <laughs> and we're all outside, and you're in here stuck. And I'm standing out there with me and one of the security guys. Who do you want me to send in for you? You want the security guy, okay? And it's just, it's just like we laugh at that because, duh, right? That's just not a big deal. That's not a big deal. We're just made differently. That's not an insult to him. That's not an insult to me. I am not insulted. Honestly, if I'm the one that's stuck in here, I am good if you send the guy in. I'm good that you send the fireman in. The one that was, that was built even physically for that function. Now, this goes the other way, too. You've got, you've got the, have you ever... Uh, when you are holding a baby, okay, and I don't care if you're like 12 or if you're, you know, you know, 60, but if you're holding a baby, there's just something that gals just kind of know how to do. Now, the first time mom's going to kind of freak out and go, okay, you got to support the head, you got to do this, you got to do this, but honestly, most of the time, like, they just get it, and they know how to hold the bottle, and it's just a very natural thing. 
you give the best, kindest man in the world, here's a baby, feed him. And they're going to be like, okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's not natural. Do we look at him and go, what is wrong with you? No. It's just, it's not natural to them. There are certain things that gals, whether you want to deny it or not, we are naturally inclined to do certain things that other ways are not. Sometimes it's in our physical build, like in the example, if you're wanting someone to rescue you from the burning building. There's just certain things that we see that, well, rescuing from the burning building, that's super heroic. And so we were like, oh no, I want, I want that for me. But I'm just telling you, starvation's, you know, that's not good either. So the feeding the baby is equally heroic. But we, we build up these things in our brain about, in our mind about what we think women should look like and we, we need to be viewed as tough and all of this kind of stuff. And we see this weaker vessel and we think that that's a, that's a ding on us. And it's not. It's actually something that's really honoring. It's saying, you're a beautiful thing to be cared for. You are still co-heir. Like, my goodness, please don't miss that. You're just made of something different. But we're not biblically, if you read scriptures, and Deborah's a great example of this, we're not these weak, wispy things that just faint, okay? And I want to just remind us of this because I think that's what the world tries to tell you, that if you don't buy into the feminist line of like, you know, I am woman, hear me roar, then you've bought into the fact that you're just like a worthless female and you're weak and, you know, all this is nonsense. That is not in the Bible, So let me remind you of a place that is clearly not in the Bible. Proverbs 31. This is one impressive woman. She seeks seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Man, this is not a weak, wispy thing that faints. She is strong. She's hardworking. She's entrepreneurial. She, she, she is very industrious with her time, works with willing hands. There is strength in this woman. And, and this is the model that scripture gives us. Like, this is a biblical woman, ladies. We're to be people that, we're to be gals that work hard, that are strong for our task. I even love the example that it gives that we're like a ship. I mean, ships, man, they're impressive to watch go through the water. And, and it says that you're like that. That we, that we have that propensity in us that it, work is not something that we're just not supposed to do. We're supposed to be industrious. Not a weak, wispy thing. Also, there's a passage in, in the psalm that I really love because it says, have you ever realized that we are called pillars? We're called pillars. Psalm 144, 12 says, May our sons and their youth be like plants, full grown, and our daughters like corner pillars cut from the structure of a palace. Now, just a freebie for you boy moms, because I had to camp out a little bit on the, on the plants. I was like, what? Why, are, why are boys plants? And how can I? The idea there is that they're, they're fruitful, that, that we're having sons that be fruitful. And Matthew Henry, he actually said about that part, he said, to see them as plants, not as weeds, not as thorns, to see them as plants growing and not withered and blasted, to see them likely to bring forth fruit unto God in their day, to see them in their youth grow strong in spirit. I think that's very sweet and something for moms with sons. That's what you're looking to do. Look at them as plants, something that's fruitful, not weeds or thorns. But if you and me and our daughters, it says that we're likened to corner pillars for the structure of a palace. Can you picture that? I put a picture up here for you guys because when you think of these pillars, you know, yes, they serve a structural purpose. Especially I look at this one that's in the corner. What happens to that structure if that pillar's not there? Well, you got a whole lot of marble chunks all over the floor. So it serves a very structural purpose. It It is very... It, it's pivotal to that, that structure staying in the way it's supposed to go, staying supported. But it also, it's like this corner pillars, you notice how ornate they are. They're, very, they're, they're beautiful to look at. They're not just, you know, a post in the ground. He likens us to corner pillars like in a palace. I think that's such a cool picture because if you think of that pillar, it's very solid, it stands tall, 
and, it, and it, it's supporting this beautiful structure, right? And there is beauty here in, in the palace. Perhaps you, you see even what, maybe we don't describe our own homes as palaces. Maybe we don't think of them that way from the outside. But what if we thought of our home as that kind, as we thought of it as a palace, what care and what, what beauty it is. But you, uh, we gals, we are described as this corner pillar. I think it's, it's a cool thing for the structure, but then also the beauty in it. I, I think about this when, um, like if, gals, if we go out of town on a trip, how's it go at home? And this is like, and this is not to overinflate women and say, oh my goodness, yeah, you know, you are everything. I'm just saying there's kind of some, some things that you're missed, mom. You're missed. Or if you don't even have kids, your husband, he misses you. He misses you. If you don't even have, uh, you know, if you're not even married, your dog. I mean, I'm just saying, like, we, we feed things, we care for things. Uh, we, when, the, when that goes away, that pillar goes away, it, it's, uh, it is definitely missed. And we know that in a very practical way. So I think our role, we need to realize that there's great importance to our role. And it, it, it's a good thing. And the, the scriptures will continue to kind of use this, this, uh, this structural imagery. I love in Proverbs 14, 1, where it says, the wisest of woman builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Boy, gals, that is a verse for us to really meditate on. And how we are building our home, we're building up our kids, we're building up our husbands, we're even just taking care of the things? Are we doing like what Proverbs says and working with willing hands? Or are we, you know, binging Netflix and scrolling through our feed and go, yeah, we'll get to all that stuff later. We can tear our house down, but we can also be builders. And ultimately, it comes back to what is our pillar built on. I love this in Ephesians 2. 19 through 22, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit." So important that, yeah, you got your pillar, but make sure you're not building that on a foundation that's based on your own strength, that's for sure, but based on the Lord himself. I love that reminder. But let's rightly understand what designed femininity looks like. Don't let the world tell you that if you don't take their, you know, I am woman, hear me roar statement, that you're, you're believing something that isn't true because the Bible does not support that type of picture of femininity in the word. So this is, again, it's just that admonition. Keep knowing your Bible um, because then you won't, be, you won't be hit by those little darts of things of, of, of doubt of like, oh, no, 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 no. We are heirs with Christ. There's just some, such good stuff in here. Okay, so Deborah is this example of biblical womanhood. And I love this. We see this. We see that she has strength. We see that she listens to the Lord. We see that she's nurturing. Now, there is a lot of the things I, that there's even some websites you can find where they've got these blogs where they talk about um, that we need as women to take on the mantle of Deborah. Or they also do one on the mantle of Esther. You know, like it's some kind of thing that we got we to, gotta, you know, put on and, you know, just be real empowered to do. I don't want to say that there isn't some good intention behind that because, again, as long as you're biblically supporting the things that you need to step into, just make sure it's in the Bible. Make sure that's something that the, that the Lord is. Remember, the Lord was telling Deborah, make sure you're listening to the Lord. But I, sometimes today I feel like we're in the spot where people are like, you know, we're just in our Deborah moment right now. We're in our Deborah moment where, you know, men aren't doing the things that they're supposed to do. So we need to be the Deborah. Read the story of Deborah and see what Deborah's really doing. Because what I think we need to do is we need to look at what our Deborah moment is. And I think that we should redefine that just a little bit. And we need to redefine it biblically. So what does our Deborah moment really look like? I think we see a couple of things that she does. The first thing she does is she, she knows who she's created to be. So as we define our Deborah moment, know who you're created to be. If you will, if you're still in Judges, just go over to Judges 5, verse 7. Like I told you, this is like a song that she and Deborah, or Deborah and Barak are singing as they finish out the battle. 
And she says this in seven. She says, I, Deborah, arose a warrior in Israel. It doesn't say that. She doesn't even say, I, Deborah, arose a judge in Israel. That would have been true. True. She doesn't say, I, Deborah, arose a superwoman in Israel. She says, I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. That's what she defines herself as. I, Deborah, rose as a mother in Israel. The thing that's cool here, she, was, she had great influence in the place that she was called, but she was not called to be anything else than what she was created to be. She identifies herself exactly according to her design. She says, I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel, not any of those words that we put on. You know, and, and I think that even if um, you're not a mom, we don't even know. Was she, did she actually have children? Her kids are never mentioned. We don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. But she, she sees herself as a mother in Israel, someone that cares for the people, someone who is nurturing them, someone who is, in this case with Barak especially, she's giving them courage and she's giving strength. She's giving godly influence. We can all do that as mothers actual or not. We can, we can those same attributes of nurture and care and prayerful influence, oh my goodness, as a prophetess, remember, she was listening to the Lord. Are we listening to the Lord? Are we listening to the Lord on what we can be doing to know exactly who we're created to be and still be this, this amazing strength and courage and godly influence like Deborah was? So we see that Deborah, she knew who she was created to be. Also in our Deborah moment, encourage faith. Man, I've already mentioned several of these, how she did this, but Read again Judges 4.14. I'll put it up on the slide this time. It says, And Deborah said to Derek, Up, for this is your day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? And then so Barak went out. So when faced with battle, she encouraged him to lead. She encourages his faith. She says, The Lord is with you. She encourages him. And the thing that I love about, you know, reading all of scripture is we have evidence that Barak's faith was encouraged, that it was built up. And maybe this is even evidence, even how the role that Deborah played in encouraging his faith. If you go to the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, guess whose name is there? In the hall of faith, it says, and what more shall I say for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah of David and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. You guys just read Judges 4 and you're going, I didn't exactly see that. No, we didn't see that example right there. But we did see Deborah playing this role of encouraging him in his faith. And we would see that there's evidence that she did exactly that because he is later in Hebrews 11, the author of Hebrews is saying, talking about the faith of Barak. That's an amazing thing to think of the impact that she may have had there. And we have a similar impact. There's there's two other uh, characters in the Bible that are barely named, but I think their impact is unbelievably huge. 2 Timothy 1.5 talks about Eunice and Lois. And it says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And who is talking here? Paul is talking to Timothy. Did did Timothy do much in the New Testament? Timothy did a lot. Timothy was a pastor in, in the churches in the New Testament. He had a great role that he led in the New in the New Testament church. Where did that faith first come from? Who encouraged that faith? Paul points out, not my wise teaching, which would have been true, right? The apostles' teaching, that would have been true. He says, actually, first, I think this faith was first encouraged in your grandma and your mom. That's who first encouraged this faith. So as we look at our Deborah moment, I think we need to see that we can encourage faith. And again, don't like the most obvious implication of this is for those of you that are moms. And oh, what an awesome and amazing responsibility that is. Fun sometimes, not fun sometimes, but every time you have opportunity that we can be encouraging this faith, you do not know who you are raising. You just don't know. 
And, and we can be encouraging that. Now, the, the, those that are not moms, that doesn't stop. That does not stop. The, those same attributes. Remember, she just identified herself as a mother in Israel. Someone that nurtures, cares, and encourages godly leadership even. Encourages the men around her. And I think this speaks to our design that we can be a mother in many ways, but especially if you've got kiddos at home, encourage their faith. Just like Eunice and Lois. I love that. I think this is something we can think about because what men are in your life, who do you picture that you can encourage their faith? And, and by that, I don't mean, you know, Deborah, she's actually giving a word to them. Sometimes that, that happens where, you know, your brother might have a, something in, where you can encourage him in his faith. But the, it might not even be that. It might just be prayer. I think that could be our biggest one, gals. Praying, 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 praying. Praying for our kids, praying for our husbands, praying for our leaders, our pastors. Pray. This Deborah moment that we are in, this encouraging faith that we get to do, absolutely encourages this level of, of, of prayer and encouraging the men in our life. Tozer said this. Now, I find it interesting because Tozer lived in 1897 to 1963. So if, this, if he was making this observation back then, where would, what would he think now? But he said, the most critical need of the church at this moment is men, bold men, free men. The church must seek in prayer and much humility the coming again of men made of the stuff of which prophets and martyrs are made. I, I, I just like this encouragement, gals, because the, I feel like there's in so many ways there is this, this blessing in that the mantle of the hits, that root beer mug that they're designed to be, that we aren't designed to be, we need that. We need that in our churches. We need that in our cities. You know, a lot of times people talk about like what's going on in schools and the things that are happening with uh, sports and different things like that. And there are many that are going, okay, we need to pray for some men to step up and, and intervene here. But gals, that might just be our role. Pray, pray. I, way too many times do we think of that and we're like, well, I guess I can pray for it. Do you not realize the power that you are tapping into. And I don't mean in a weird, like, okay, I just need to pray a certain way and, you know, call upon the Spirit in a certain, no, 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 that's not biblical. Just pray. It doesn't have to be flowery. It doesn't have to be, you know, said in a certain way. Talk to your Father in heaven who loves you, who loves the people that are around you, and ask the only one that can make any difference at all to intervene. Appeal to him. I... I just wonder, you know, and when we did the prayer study, uh, that was the one we finished up in the fall. It was so cool to hear how many just answered prayers came out of little circles that met in this room. You guys sent us emails. And at the end, the last study, remember you guys put an answered prayer. Those were some amazing prayers uh, that were answered in this little tiny four-month study. And I know the Lord is doing things like that all the time. But we often relegate prayer as to like, well, it's, you know, it's just prayer. That's really all I can do. I think prayer is pivotal into how we encourage faith. Because sometimes, gals, this needs to be something that we are only doing with the Lord, only flapping to the Lord, and not necessarily always giving our opinion on everything. It's true. We need to be doing like what Deborah, where she listens to the Lord, and she, and she says that thing. Do you ever wonder, was she tempted? Was she a little frustrated that Barak wasn't leading? Did she want to say like, okay, I'm just, yeah, I know the Lord said this, but you know what, I'm just gonna take care of it because I can just do it faster and better myself. Honestly, ladies, you know that we have a temptation to be that way, right? So she might've been tempted to do that too. But she was obedient to only do what the Lord was asking her to do, only operate through the design that the Lord had created her to be, not to step into any other, other thing, but to just do what the Lord, and the thing is, it's not less than. It's not even close than less than. They, they end up having a giant victory that is saved. Israel stays at peace for decades after this event. You read in Hebrews how the faith of Barak is something that we read about even in the New Testament. I'd say she had a really mighty, powerful role there. But let's call it what it is. Let's, let's look at that role for what she really was designed to be. I don't want to add to it. It's pretty good all on its own. 
So let's be praying. Let's encourage faith. Um, one, one prayer, I've been, I've been reading this passage a ton lately, and this comes right after the armor of God passage. But it says this at the end of that, and it says, uh, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then Paul adds this, he says, and also for me, that the words may be given to me to open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare, in, it, declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's, you know, Paul was even going, oh, would you pray for me that I would be bold, that I would say the things that the Lord wants me to speak? Pray that prayer for the men in your life. Pray that for our pastors and our leaders in our country. The scriptures tell us to be praying for people in authority. Pray that. Pray that they would be bold, that they would be, that they would be able to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, it says there. I love that. Last thing that I think that we see with this, all, she had so much God-given influence, and I think we do as well, when we rightly apply this example of, of Deborah, to not be someone we're not, but to encourage faith, specifically of the men in our life, and then finally to give God all the glory. This is the last thing she does, and I love this. She doesn't take any credit for herself. You see this in verse 15, where at the end of the, of the story of the battle, and she talks about that the Lord routed Sisera. And then Judges 5 goes in when she, she sings about it. She gives the Lord credit. Talks about how this, the, what? This river swept up? That wasn't supposed to happen. That was the Lord. She gives credit to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us the same thing. It says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I love this attitude that Deborah has to just give the Lord glory. And, and this, is a, this is a non-cultural one too, because we kind of want to go, but yeah, but look what I did. Look, what I, look at the role I played. That's not what Deborah shows us. She shows us that she doesn't take credit, that she doesn't give glory to herself or even to Barak. She gives the glory all to the Lord. One final verse, I just want to finish with this. It says in 1 Peter 4, 7, long passage, but I wanted to include a little bit more because sometimes we feel just like the beginning, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Be good stewards of God's design for you. Not of the things he didn't design you for. Don't worry about those. Just, just be a good steward. Some of the things that he even mentions in this list, showing hospitality, serving one another, things that we could go, those are things I can do. Those are things that I was designed to do. Those are things I'm commanded to do that in everything God would be glorified. And I, I just, I, I, that can sound like a really churchy thing. Oh yeah, give God the glory. But like the thing that's, that's tricky with that is sometimes we have to really examine our motives on why we do something. Even the good things. Doing things because we want people to make it look like we've got it all together. Do we tell people that we're gonna pray about that because then it makes it sound like super holy and spiritual? Or do we really want to go and pray about it so that we can give the Lord the glory for the victory that he's gonna have? Check your attitude in your heart. But I love this example that we have of Deborah. You know, the world says she is a feminist model of empowerment. But the Bible, I think the Bible says she was a woman just as God designed her to be. She was just as God designed her to be. She encouraged faith and she gave God all the glory. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this example of Deborah in the Bible. That Lord, you show us this unique woman that had influence exactly in, the, in step with her beautiful design that you created her to be. Lord, I pray that we would rightly apply, apply scripture to who we are, the roles that we play, the decisions that we make. 
I pray, Lord, that we would not superimpose our culture or even our feeling or experience of something, maybe even the ways we think other people have dropped the ball on what we read on Scripture, but we would just read it as it as it's there. And Lord, I pray that we would notice the things that you notice, that we would be excited about the things that you have made us to be and do, and that we would do those things in abundance, that we would be fruitful in those things. Lord, just as this, this last verse, that it feels like the end of all things is near sometimes. And Lord, your word also tells us in Psalm 90 that, you have, that we need to be taught to count our days. We only get a certain amount. And Lord, I pray that the, woman, the women that are here, the women that are hearing this online, Lord, that they would take each of those days and they would walk wisely. That they would consider their steps that they would look and see how, Lord, could I be more in line with your scripture, more in line with your created design for me. Lord, I pray that the, that the toxicity of the world would just be so highlighted to us. I pray we would see it exactly for what it is. I pray we would be able to spot the lies that the enemy is throwing at us. And Lord, I thank you that while I, I, I believe that you will show us those lies, I also just thank you that you just give us this sense of contentment and fulfillment and wholeness as we desire to be who you made us to be. So Lord, I pray you would give us a right application of your scripture when it comes to all things, but particularly as we look at who we are, Lord, I pray that we would just walk in step with you. So Lord, I pray for the, the women that in all stages of life, whether they are, um, whether they're still in school or they're married or they're moms or grandmas, Lord, there are things that you've called us to do. And I pray, Lord, that we would be women that pray. I pray that we would come before your throne daily, multiple times in the day, in our cars, doing laundry, wherever we are, Lord. I pray that we would just have a constant conversation with you, Lord, and that we would just have this nearness to you, but that we would just be, the, the, the people, the leaders that in our lives, that you would, you would put those on our hearts often to be praying for, Lord. And we do pray even now. We pray for the, the pastors, the elders here at Athey Creek. We ask, Lord, that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would give them strength. Lord, I pray that you would help them to proclaim boldly the mysteries of the gospel. We pray for the leaders in our country, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that people would turn to you. We pray for the, the men in our households, whatever age, our husbands, our brothers, our dads. Lord, would you raise up men who just desire to walk after you? And I pray you would find a group of women in this room and anywhere that's listening that want to encourage that faith in those that are around them. So Lord, thank you so much. Give us wisdom to, to do the things that you ask us to do. Give us the boldness to do what you ask us to do. And we just thank you for, for your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.